information technology auditing. And we're going to look at this from two perspectives. How do you use information technology in an audit? And how do you audit information technology? Because it's a law that we have to talk about Sarbanes-Oxley in every class, we'll start off, we'll talk a little bit about Sarbanes-Oxley. And we have to talk about Enron, so we'll talk about Enron. Um, then we'll talk about how do you audit IT? How do you audit your computer systems? How do you test your controls? How do you test your transactions? And what's the auditor's responsibility at the end of that audit? Then we'll talk about how do you use computers in audits. These are terms you may have seen in other classes, auditing around the computer, through the computer, and with the computer. Let's first talk about kind of the bigger picture that gets us to the audit. Every um, company has a variety of stakeholders, both inside the company and outside of the company. Outsiders include the government, regulators, those who are suppliers of yours. Why would suppliers be a stakeholder? Because they're going to advance you credit, and they want to make sure you can pay. Um, your customers want to make sure that they're doing business, if they're having long-term contracts with you, with a company that's going to be around. Your creditors, much like suppliers, want to make sure that you're going to pay them, whether financial institutes or whatever, institutions. And we're including investors as external. I mean, they're kind of, they, they kind of external, but they actually own the company. Um, but they, of course, want to make sure that if they purchase stock in your company, that that stock is going to go up, or at least not go down. Then you have the people inside of the company who are also stakeholders the employees and their managers and executives, the board of directors and the audit committee. We're showing these two off to the side, board of directors and audit committee, because the hope is that they would be somewhat independent from the day to day and would have a, an oversight capacity <coughs> over the corporation's activities. So the purpose of, the, of any audit is to improve the quality of information. If you think of external auditing, PwC or whoever, what they're trying to do is ensure that the information that the company is providing to the general public about their financial well-being is in fact quality information that the, the general public can rely upon. So the purpose of an audit is to ensure that the quality of information is correct, it's accurate, and it's complete. We think of audits as CPAs, external auditors, but it could be internal auditors. In our little world, there's IT auditors, whether internal or external. And of course, the government will come in and audit from time to time um, if they think that there's some impropriety. Within internal auditing, any of you plan on being internal auditors? It's a hard job. It's an important job and a hard job because every, you're hated. You know, your job is to slow them down, to get in their way, to make sure that things are right. Their job is to get it out the door so that they can make money for the company. And so it takes a special kind of person to do that right. So a controls audit is there to ensure, remember the last chapter we talked about controls, ensure that all these controls are in compliance with the policies and procedures of the company, and to ensure that the actual controls are in fact doing their job. There are also, internal auditors are also there to make sure the company is running efficiently. We focus more on the controls audit in this class, but you know, internal auditors are also there to make sure that things are happening in the way they should be happening and the departments of the company are working properly. External auditors, they assert a few things. They assert that the assets and liabilities that the company says they have actually exist, that the income and expenses that the company said they incurred in a period of time actually did occur, that the financial statements reflect fully all of these facts, that to the extent you have assets and liabilities that need to be valued from time to time, that those valuations are up to date and correct, and that the presentation of the financial statements are done to the rules of the government and any disclosures that need to be made are made.
talk about the history a little bit of corporate governance. It really started in the 1960s after the stock market crash of 1929, 1930s stock market crash of 1929. The SEC was created at that time um, to try to stem the, um, some of the rampant things that were being done, uh, done to manipulate the markets. Um, one of the things that came out of that time period was a, a law called Glass-Steagall. Have any of you ever heard of Glass-Steagall? It has to do with trading. If you look right now, you had J.P. Morgan Bank and Morgan Stanley Investment Bank, separate companies, because of Glass-Steagall. You know, banks, commercial banks, could not trade their own, for their own account. Right, that's what Glass-Steagall was trying to create, a separation between trading companies and commercial banks because with the stock market failure, you needed to have faith that your bank, your real bank, was going to you know, invest the money properly and that if you put $100 in, that $100 wasn't going to be bet on the stock market in such a way that it was going to go away. Um, over the years, Glass-Steagall started to disappear and it did, you know, it never was taken off the books, it just stopped being enforced. And in fact, Goldman Sachs has a commercial bank now and they're all back to where they were. And that's a risk. Enron, WorldCom, Tyco. Who wants to talk Enron? And they, what they were doing is they had these shell companies, they were hiding all their losses. They were manipulating the energy prices in California. <coughs> the leadership of the company was getting out of the stock but telling the employees to keep staying in. It was just an embarrassment, right? Did many different things and they went down and Arthur Anderson went down with them. Because Arthur Anderson's job was to uh, assess the financial wellness of the company and they, they lost sight of what they were doing. They were too tight with the leadership and it took an entire company down. Luckily the employees of Arthur Anderson just went on, went to the other accounting firms for the most part. They, you know, they, because whoever they did audits for beforehand, still needed audits. So PwC took over an Arthur Anderson audit because Arthur Anderson no longer existed. They needed people. Grab the staff from Arthur Anderson. It was an easy switch. WorldCom. Anybody know WorldCom? Yeah, they just bogeyed up their balance sheet. They were a tiny company that kept buying these bigger companies with bigger, by, by just having bogus, a bogus balance sheet. And, um, they don't exist. They bought, there used to be a, a telecom company, MCI, they bought, um, and some others. MCI exists as a little tiny kernel of a company now. WorldCom doesn't. Um, Tyco, anyone know Tyco? A good company, still exists as a company, as a good company. Um, they actually have products and stuff. Um, yeah, embezzlement may not be the right term, but very close. Kozlowski was his name, and he um, had a million dollar toilet seat in his office. Threw his wife a huge party, I think in Libya, with like Elton John singing and all that stuff yeah. on company funds, and just essentially using the company's money for his own playground. He and the CFO were in cahoots on this. And the, but the company had real profits, it was a real company, and they are still a going concern, a good company now. They survived him, because while it was a lot of money, it was probably was not a lot of money, in the impetus of, in, in the comparison to their size. So with all of these things and others in the late 1990s, these were the roaring days of just the stock market doing great and <coughs> all that stuff. They came up with Sarbanes-Oxley. But some of the key things that, some of the key things that came out of it is code number 201, identify the services that are outside of the practice of auditors, meaning the audit companies to a great degree had to sell their consulting companies or downsize them. In the case of Ernst & Young, where I was on the consulting side, we got sold to Capgemini because the consultants could not build computer systems for audit clients any longer. So what has ENY done over the last 15 years, 13 years? They've just rebuilt their consulting practice. So Sarbanes Oxley is slowly eroding, slowly eroding in much the same way Glass Steagall eroded over years. Um, two, management becomes responsible for internal controls. You couldn't say I didn't know. 
you're responsible. If you're an executive in a company, you're personally responsible for the, you know, the success of the controls in your company. And similarly, if you're the senior management, you must certify the financial statements. You could say, oh, that was the auditor's thing. No, the auditors are just there confirming what you've done. You're personally responsible for the financial reports. So some of the impacts of Sarbanes-Oxley, you had to be more, not, you know, senior management needed to become more knowledgeable about accounting and financial systems. Um, management had to certify financial information. If they didn't, they, were, they had rigid penalties. And they needed to really focus on corporate governance within their companies. The good news is for accountants and consultants and IT departments, created more work. So for the executives, the more work was a bad thing. For consultants and accountants, it was a good thing. It created opportunity. Um, it created more paperwork if you wanted a file to become a public company. This is really to protect public companies, right? If you're a private company, there's a lot more room to do whatever you want to do because it's not the public's um, in interest. It's not in the public's interest to know how you're doing. Um, so more paperwork was necessary. You had to have your information ready in a more timely fashion. And we've talked about needing to monitor your internal controls. Faster financial reporting. So, Newt Gingrich, who knows who Newt Gingrich is? This is a little bit old, but it's still fun. Uh, who knows Newt Gingrich? Who's heard his name? He's run for president a couple times, from Georgia. Um, I don't know, used to be a congressman <coughs> in, the, in the Reagan years. Kind of um, conservative guy. So, generally, if you want to just cast people in broad strokes, Republicans, less you know, less legislation, Democrats, more oversight. He was a Republican. His belief is Sarbanes-Oxley goes too far, too much oversight. Um, his points of view are, one, it didn't solve the problems. We had 2008, 2009 happened, so it wasn't a pure solution, clearly. Um, it costs money because it takes 12 years to go public now compared to prior to Sarbanes-Oxley, five years. Just the, the effort you have to put, on, put in to be ready to go public is that much greater. And so it implies that there's a $4 million, and this is old, it's probably a $10 million tax right now, you know, implied tax to go in public. Oxley, the second half of Sarbanes-Oxley said, I would have written it differently. Everyone felt like Rome was burning. So let's talk about information technology audits. This is the concept of auditing your technology environment. Really what you're trying to accomplish is answering the question, is the software that you're using competent? Is it capable of doing what it's supposed to be doing? Obviously, if, you don't, if your software doesn't do what it's supposed to be doing, you could have lots of problems. The problems may fall into two categories. I'll do the second one first. If you have software that's doing the wrong thing, the problems are bigger. If you had a person doing the wrong thing on paper, um, yeah, they may mess up a transaction and you might lose a little bit of money. The size of the problem when computers are doing the wrong thing is multiplied because there are lots of transactions. And do the, it'll do the wrong thing over and over and over and over again. So you have more extreme consequences of computers, logic that is wrong, computers that are allowing hackers in, things of that nature. The consequences are higher. The second thing is because you're trusting your computers and you believe they're doing the right thing, you don't have very good visibility when there is a problem and you run the risk of not finding out until well after the fact, until it's too late. So it's important to audit your technology to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. A lot of what we're about to talk about mirrors what we talked about last time. For all the things you need to have controls for, you should, be, you should need to audit those controls. 
You want to make sure that your data is reliable, confidential, secure, and available. And you also want to make sure that it's running your, all your systems are running effectively. So an IT audit has four phases. Starts with planning the audit. It finishes with completing the audit. And in the middle, you test your internal controls and you do substantive testing. Subst substantive testing means you test your actual transactions to make sure that what you think should happen in those transactions actually do happen. And it might be a little bit counterintuitive, but the stronger your controls, the less the less you need to test them, and the more you need to test your transactions. It goes against logic. If you have weak controls and you're spending a dollar on audits, you should spend your money on figuring out where your controls are weak, more so than on the substantive controls. Let's talk about each of those four sections. The planning stage starts with establishing the scope and objectives and then learning your client's business. You really need to determine what's material and what's not material. I'm sure this is a term that you've heard over and over again. Materiality answers the question, does the risk affect the decisions of a knowledgeable financial statement user? So does the risk of a mistake in a certain area affect the decision? So material in a lot of our terms is the dollar size big enough, and that's how it would affect it. Or in the case of a control, if there's a problem, would the result of that problem, the risk of that problem, potentially have a meaningful um, impact on the business? And so you, after you determine what's material, you kind of determine what's the level of acceptable risk. And then you develop your tests, internal controls and substantive testing. How are you going to test the environment, the IT environment? This is... Um, the flow, you guys are good at this because this was the first half of our semester. And that, here's that kind of that point in the process where can you rely on the internal controls? If you can rely on the internal controls, then you emphasize testing them. So if you believe you can rely on them, then you really want to test to prove that you can rely on them. That's what's counterintuitive. So if you believe yes here, then you focus your testing on validating that yes. Now, if you think the internal controls are terrible, then don't spend your time trying to test them. You want to spend your time saying, OK, we, we don't trust these internal controls. Are the transactions going through correctly or not? And so you really have to spend your time testing the transactions because this is, not, you know, this is a waste of your time. There are plenty of you know, different kinds of risk. You can lose company secrets. You, you know, some people could come in, or hack in, and manipulate files. Or you could lose access to your computers. The process that you might do in this risk assessment in the planning phase is you understand what the threats are. You, you identify what controls should be in place. As an audit firm, you have a pretty good sense of what the possible controls are. So you have the controls that should be in place. You look at the controls that are in place, and you evaluate the gap between those two things. It's called a gap analysis. You look for the difference between what they should be doing and what they are doing. And to do that, you test their various control environments, segregations of duty, so these are all the different <laughs> internal controls they should have. And the idea is you want to test each of these versus what they should be doing versus what they aren't doing. And the application controls the same thing. Do they use financial totals or hash totals in some way for the batch processes? Um, do they make sure that their transactions are being completed? We talked about checkpointing to make sure they get to completion. They don't get partially completed. Do they do the appropriate validation checks, et cetera. So the purpose of the controls tests are to make sure that they are doing the right thing in terms of internal controls, processing controls, 
there are a few different ways to, to test processes. We'll talk about each of these. Um, test data, program tracing. Test data means when you're, when you're doing your testing of your processes, don't test using real data because real data does not necessarily massage all of the if-then statements everywhere in a program. You create test data that massages every exception and makes sure that everything will process correctly. Program tracing, you actually use, there are programs that monitor programs so that when you put in a transaction, it shows you exactly which lines of code are being accessed. So you trace the logic through the code and make sure that a transaction is going on the right pathway to completion. Um, We'll talk more in detail in a moment on integrated test facilities, parallel simulation, and embedded audit mod modules. Three different methodologies um, that are used by audit firms. And for whatever, you know, they're, they're part of the kind of the world, if you've heard the term continuous auditing, something that Rutgers is pretty big in, in particularly in the graduate program. Um, Outputs, you want to make sure there are audit trails, make sure that rounding is done right. Etc. Now we go into the world of testing transactions and balances, the substantive testing side of it. In this case, rather than testing that the control environment is right, you're testing to ensure through direct evidence that your transactions are completing correctly. And we'll talk about that in more detail after we talk about completion. When you're all done, you write, uh, the auditor's responsibility is to write up a document saying whether or not they believe that the, the statements, the, the IT processes that they're seeing are in fact doing what they should be doing. And this is probably the hardest thing for an auditor to do. It's to exercise professional skepticism. What does that mean? Professional skepticism. You have to be doubtful about everything that's being done. You have to assume that it's going to be wrong. You start off with, with that as your mindset and then prove, it, prove yourself wrong that things are working correctly. Now that's, ha that's hard because as an auditor, you have a dual responsibility. One is to protect the public and two is to protect your, com your company, your audit firm's bottom line. right? So if you're like skeptical, skeptical and annoying, which is like the natural way to be skeptical, you're going to piss off the client and they'll go to a different <coughs> audit firm. So professional skepticism says you need to exercise the proper amount of skepticism while still maintaining the proper relationship with the client in the process. And that's professional skepticism. And it's a hard thing to do. When you're done, you write a letter of representation. I'm sorry, the, 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 the firm writes a letter of representation saying they believe that what the auditor said is true. The auditors would write their statement about what they've audited. It would come in four flavors. It's either unqualified, qualified, adverse, or disclaimer, which is the one that a company wants to get. Unqualified means it's great and there's nothing wrong. Qualified is it's good, but there are some things we'd rather see different. Adverse, uh, it's not so good. And disclaimer says, we only do this because we got paid. We, have not, you know, we don't believe in this. So it goes from best to worst. These results are meant, what the auditors say is meant primarily for the external stakeholders, that top half. So that those people, those people who are not inside the company, have a belief that what they're seeing from the company is in fact truthful. The intern, you know, the auditors will also undoubtedly have spent hours and hours with management of the company. And if they have some problems, work those through. Many times you can work those through and they go away and you're able to give an unqualified review. Um, but they'll, a more detailed report will go to management so they know where things should change going forward. But the primary audience, that the simple blurb that the auditors put out, is meant for the external audience.
Okay. Use of computers in auditing. Three ways to do it. You either audit around, through, or with the computer. Around, through, or with. Around and through are two different approaches towards how does the audit team interact with the computer to test transactions. The third one, audit with, is how does the audit team use computers in their data. Around. This top side is what the company does. Not the auditors, but the company they're auditing does. They have master files, they have transaction files. Their computers are viewed as a black box. The auditors know nothing about what's inside that black box. They don't try to know what's inside that black box. And then as a result of the processing, the way it happens is, so the, bit, the company goes through their business and they produce these reports. The auditors take some transactions that they just, through some logical fashion, take some transactions from the environment on paper. They do what they think this black box should be doing. And they just, on paper, solve the problem. And they produce their own report on paper and compare the two. And if they are the same, great. If they're not the same, they have to figure out where the problems are. So auditing around the computer implies you don't really think about what's going on in the computer system. It's probably not the way to go if you have a highly computerized client um, because you're ignoring the computer. It's good if you have a smaller client. The size of the audit might be relatively small because uh, you don't have to have a whole lot of knowledge about how the computer technology is used. So it's suitable if they don't really use computers very much, so it's not an important component of the business. They have a good audit trail. They have reports that come out in the back end, so you can use those to compare to. And they have good documentation, because you need to, as you're going to figure out what you're doing, and what, if you're, as you're going to try to replicate what the black box was doing, you need documentation so that you can replicate it um, appropriately. So that's auditing around the computer, through the computer. A few different ways to audit through the computer. This first way is the use of test data. As we said, you'd rather use test data than actual transactions, because actual transactions don't think of all possibilities. They're gonna, you're going to handle the 95% rule with that. You could do it if, you know, one way of doing it is you use these test transactions, you run them through the system, you also manually prepare um, what you believe the results are, and then you compare the two. This is one model of auditing through the computer, simply using test data to run rather than using transactions. That's the kind of the first level. The advantage is you can test some of the control procedures. You need to, even with this approach, you need to start understanding the environment better than auditing around the computer. So again, you need to be prepared with a large enough audit that can support this. Example test data. Could be a customer with a number on a sales order must exist in the accounts receivable file. So you put in test data, one customer that does exist on the file, one that does not, and see what happens for the customer that does not exist. You'd expect it to kick out in some way. And so that would be examples of, you know, we have an exception process and make sure that the exception process is also being um, handled correctly. The second model, that was the test data model. The second model is integrated test facility. We have a different picture here. What you do is you use the actual programs that the company uses for their day-to-day -day processing, and you create a dummy entity. You know how a company might have many sub-companies? Multinational firms have different sub-companies. You create an additional sub-company, or an additional department, if you would, and you run transactions through that fake department so that you can do it without having to um, 
corrupt the real data. You might, you know, so the master file is going to have data in it that's not supposed to be in it, as will the transaction files. But that data, because it's pointing to this dummy entity, doesn't really affect the financials. Okay? And that's what an integrated test facility does. So you can then see how the results in that dummy entity compared to what you expected them to be. So you actually use the, the programs um, for your testing. The nice part of this is you're actually using the computer systems exactly as the, um, the real users are using them. You do need to have extensive computer knowledge. And of course, since you're putting in these dummy transactions, and unless you're doing it at night when no one else is using the system, you run the risk of kind of getting in the way of the, of the real business. But this is used in, in the real world. Embedded audit module. You have your real-time online system, and then there's just like a little sub-module, right, in there that's monitoring what's going on. That's your audit module. And it reports out what it sees. So as real transactions are occurring or fake transactions, that audit module is, sits inside of your your production environment. So instead of having a separate company or a separate department set up, it'll actually just monitor the real transactions. It's limited in its use because it's expensive. And equally, that little audit module, it slows down every online transaction. And you really want your, um, your online world to be slowed down in that fashion. And finally, we have parallel simulation. You actually have your auditors rewrite the programs that are used in production. So you have an IT force rewrite programs. And you get results, and <coughs> the real system get results, and you automatically match them. And any exceptions that come out, you need to determine what was the cause. More often than not, I would imagine these would be wrong. Again, pretty expensive to do. You would only consider this for really high risk um, areas within a very large audit that you want to make sure is being audited to the fullest extent possible. So. You know, that you wouldn't do this, you know, companies have thousands of computer programs. You wouldn't be doing this for all 1,000 of the computer programs. It doesn't make sense. But there's a very high risk kind of sub-entity, a, a trading, you know, department, proprietary trading department. You may want to do something like this to confirm that it's doing it right. These are all part of what's considered continuous auditing. As I said, um, Rutgers graduate program is, that's all some f fairly forward-thinking research in this area and has a pretty good reputation in the field. These embedded audit modules, exception reports, all these things that are happening throughout the audit, you know, 365 days a year. You don't come in and then audit, you know, for just, you know, the one month and then sign off. The audit is a 365-day process, and that's continue audit, continuous auditing. Auditing with the computer. This is what tools does the auditor use to do their job? They use Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, maybe Microsoft Access. I've, I've gotten emails from former students who have used Access in the real world, and it's been good for them. Otherwise, they wouldn't have emailed me, I'm guessing. I used Access, and it sucked. Got fired. <laughs> No, it worked out. It was nice because they were able to do things that could not be done easily in spreadsheets. Then they use some software that's been developed specifically for auditors, IDEA, which is essentially an SQL kind of data analysis tool. 
and other um, generalized audit software. So you can kind of verify calculations, select sample transactions if you wanted to compare, ensure that limits of validation rules are being tested correctly. Expert systems. So expert systems is AI, AI artificial intelligence, really. In the simplest case, expert systems or artificial intelligence is just a learning system. As transactions come through, it learns about what works and what doesn't work, and it changes how it operates based upon what it's learned. That's more or less what these expert systems do. Certainly you need things that will generate per charts. Remember per charts? And all those kind of good things. Because an audit is a project, and a project needs to be managed. And then SQL-based things. And finally, auditors, in order to get paid, need to generate a lot of paperwork. A lot of, so you have software that helps to manage working papers. and will help to generate appropriate financial reports.